Let us pray. Our Father, we come before you humbled and uh, Father, we love you so much. We thank you for all that you've done for us. We don't understand how you uh, care for us the way you have and the way you've, uh, even your commandments, Father, come with so many blessings. And we pray, Father, that you will help us as we strive to be your people in this evil world, to not be discouraged, but to love you more than we love ourselves and more than we love the cares of this world. Father, we pray for this group that meets here. We thank you for this meeting. We thank you for their love of the truth and for the reputation to stand for the truth and for our brother uh, Chumley who's come to speak. We pray that you will also continue to bless him. We thank you for his uh, dedication to you and for the ability that he has and we are, uh, ask you to bless him as he prepares to speak to us about the things you've said about the home. Father, we again pray for the leadership here. We pray for every member here. We pray that as we all fight our individual battles that you will lift us up, you will encourage us, that you will help us to, to uh, fight off the devil and to encourage as many people as we can, Father, to do the same thing. We pray, Father, that if we are successful in anything that we will always reflect uh, the light on to you and to give you the glory. Father, may we never outlive our love for you and for the things that we've done or said or thought that have not represented you or that have been sinful, we pray for your forgiveness. It's to your son and our savior that we pray. First one. 
I have lived in that uh, period of American history that's seen more change culturally, morally, ethically than any other era in this nation's history. Uh, when I was a kid, America was known as a Christian nation. It's not a 32nd cousin to a Christian nation any longer. It's pagan to the core. And every day there's evidence that it's becoming more heathenized, more barbaric, more pagan. And if I had to point to one thing that is the cause of all that, it is the demise of the home, the destruction of the family. Uh, that's why schools don't turn out scholars like they used to. That's why learning has been so watered down and nothing that teachers can do, nothing that uh, school boards can do, local governments can do, changes that. The family's been destroyed. Uh, the town where I grew up um, at one time was a very vibrant community built on solid families, solid homes, and now it's uh, essentially a slum because there aren't the solid families any longer. And the destruction of the home will bring down everything with it because everything else sits on the family, sits on the marriage, sits on the home, the, the governmental entity. Uh, the church will be no better than the families who make it up. And I tonight want to try to say something about God's plan for marriage, the biblical blueprint for marriage. It's a pleasure to have you here. It's another nasty night to come out. Uh, Jeff drove a couple hours from Cincinnati to be here, and I appreciate him doing that. But I appreciate all of you taking the time and making the choice to come out this evening. Uh, there are three basic texts we're going to look at. This is going to be a Bible study tonight. If you want to be turning back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2, while you're doing that, let me say that not only are there problems in society, not only are there, uh, is there a breakdown of the family in the secular part of our nation, but the fact of the matter is that separations and divorce among Christians are increasing. And we are witnessing the disappearance of the distinctive Christian home. And I'm not talking about a home in which Christians reside, I'm talking about a home in which Christ rules, in which his will, his word, has been allowed to, to, to permeate down and infiltrate every aspect of the relationship, husband, wife, parents, child, and the family is governed by what God says. And so we're going to go to Scripture tonight to see what God says. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 1 and 2 to talk about the foundation of the family, then to Ephesians chapter 5 to talk about the husband's role and responsibility and conclude with 1 Peter chapter 3, talking about the wife's role and responsibility. If you're back in Genesis chapter 1, look at verse 26. There are some interesting contrasts in the first two chapters of Genesis. And in chapter 1, we have this contrast. Several times over, God says, let there be, let there be light, let there be a firmament. But in verse 26, on the sixth day of the first week, Instead of let there be, he says, let us make. And what he's talking about is man in God's image. And look at verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. I find it remarkable that in the very first mention of man's creation, that which the Spirit of God chose to underscore was the polarity of the sexes. Male and female created he them. Men and women are different. Now, they're the same in the spiritual realm. They are, are persons with immortal souls. They are not things or objects to be used and discarded on the basis of another's selfishness. But physically, psychologically, emotionally, men and women are different. There's no such thing as a human being without maleness or femaleness. And if a person ever expects to fulfill what God made them for, to live up to all of the potential that is in them, they're going to either have to cultivate their masculinity or their femininity. God did not make any transgenders. 
and part of the paganism that is on the rise in this society is the support of such uh, ungodly notions as that. Sexual distinctions are God-given. And even in noting that, that's a serious blow to the homosexual community. Why should God create a, a woman for a man if a man can satisfy a man? And the tragedy of the age has been this blurring of the sexes, the feminizing of men and the masculinizing of women, and that's not what God intended. And when God made what he made, he looked at it all and pronounced it very good. Now come down to verse 18 of chapter 2. Chapter 1 really should have ended in the third verse of chapter 2 because the first three verses of chapter 2 are the last day of the first week. And that's where the chapter break, I think, should have occurred. And a lot of people, not, not realizing what they're reading here, have thought that in Genesis 2, Moses is describing um, a second creation of some sort. No, that's not what he's doing. He's, he's giving more detail about some things he had spoken of generically in, in chapter 1. Especially, he is going to give us more detail about what happened on the sixth day when God created man. And we've got another contrast here. Six times in chapter 1, God says it was good. But in verse 18, chapter 2, he says there is something that is not good. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him an helper, King James, a help meet, comparable, suitable to him. This word helper or help meet in the Hebrew indicates a helper who is fit, not one who gives fits, but one who is fitted to, one who is adapted to, one who is comparable to, the one that is being helped, perfectly complementing. You know, have you ever heard somebody say, I had to get married? Or People speaking of a couple, and they say they had to get married. You ever heard that? You know what they're talking about when they say that? They're talking about a couple that committed the sin of fornication, and conception followed, and because of that, people think they have to get married. No, they don't. And often, the sin of fornication has been compounded by people entering an ill-advised marriage. The perfect mate is not finding somebody you can live with, it's finding somebody you can't live without. And that's all wrapped up in this word helper, help meet. There's one thing worse than being unmarried, and that's being married to the wrong person. And so God intends in marriage that two people find themselves and realize they can't be without one another. Now, I think verse 20, uh, 18 is remarkable. When God says it's not good that man should be alone, I mean, that's an ex extraordinary statement. Um, in verse 20, Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And it was not good. And you know why I think that's an astounding statement? Let me give you four reasons. At the time God said of Adam that his situation was not good, Adam lived in a perfect environment. They weren't talking about global warming. They weren't talking about smog. They weren't talking about poison air. Adam lived in a perfect environment. Secondly, Adam had a creative potential so great that he could name all of the animals. Now, that was quite a feat because a name in Bible terms spoke of nature, the nature, the characteristics of the one name. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that God created Adam with a Ph.D. intellect. 
You know, I've heard that we use about 10% of our brain, something like that. I don't know how they know that, but that's, that's what I've heard, about 10% of the brain. Our, our thinking, our intellect has been impacted by the curse that God has put on this world. And there has been a degrading of man's abilities and capabilities. But that wasn't the way it was with Adam. Can you imagine what a guy using 90%, 100% of his brain, not just 10%, but the other 90% as well, can you imagine what Thomas Edison could have done using 100% of his brain living for over 900 years like Adam did? He named all of the animals. Thirdly, he had an expanding responsibility. He was to subdue and bring under his authority all of the lesser creation. He was given a work to do. And fourthly, maybe most importantly, Adam at this point in time had perfect unbroken fellowship with God. And yet God said it was not good. And to rectify that, he didn't make him 10 friends. He made him one woman. And look in verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. From the side of Adam, he took a rib, fashioned man. He brought the woman to man. And in verse 23, Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. That sounds like something an egghead would say, and doesn't it? You know, a PhD, that's now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Well, what I have stumbled across is um, some writers who say that, that while that may be an accurate translation of the Hebrew, what's not recognized here is that we're translating an idiom. And you know, when you take an idiom from one language to another, it doesn't always translate. I read once about the phrase out of sight, out of mind, being translated from English into France. In French, it was invisible, insane, out of sight, out of mind. And what I have been uh, told by those who claim to know is that if we brought this idiom into a term or phrase that really expresses what Adam was saying here, um, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my, what, what he was saying was, wow. He had seen all these animals. They weren't like him. And man, here's someone like him. It blew his socks off. And that's when we have this conclusion. Man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, this conclusion is so important. It's repeated by Jesus in the Gospels and by Paul in the epistles. And there are two strong verbs used in verse 24 by divine design. They are the words leave and the verb cleave. The verb leave means to forsake. It means to abandon. It is not a reference to responsibility. Children never get to the point where they're not responsible for honoring their parents. You know, involved in the concept of honor sometimes is providing, showing your honor by providing for the needs of the ones honored. And I believe that's part of what God intends in the family, that the parents who care for the children in the child's infancy are cared for by the parents and the parents' infirmity. So leave isn't talking about we get to the point where we don't have to care for our parents. It's talking about relationship. There is to be a severing of one relationship, the parent-child relationship, to the establishing of a new relationship, the husband-wife relationship, and that's the nucleus of the atom, the husband-wife, not the parent-child. Children are out there in orbit around the nucleus. You try to bring an electron in orbit into the nucleus, you're going to have an explosion. You're going to have dysfunction. The center of it all is the husband-wife relationship. You know, there are about three stages that individuals go through growing up. 
The first is the stage of childhood, which is a period of dependence. The child is utterly dependent upon the parents for life, for survival, for care, for feeding, for protection, for everything. The child will not live unless the parents care for it. Well, the child grows up and enters the period of the stage of adolescence, which is a period of independence. In the adolescent stage, the bird is starting to flex its wings. There's often a lot of stress in a family when children enter the adolescent stage because as they are starting to pull away from mom and dad, mom and dad's tendency is to pull back. And that creates tension. The characteristic of the adolescent is independence. Not dependence, but independence. And they often express that by being resentful of authority. They resent their teachers, their parents, the preacher, the elders, the guy. You know, they, they just resent anyone trying to impinge upon their independence. Well, hopefully that individual keeps growing and leaves the stage of adolescence and enters the stage of maturity, which is a period of interdependence. Where in your maturity, you seek not your own good first, but you seek the good of others ahead of yourself. Now, let me go back to the adolescent stage. Here's some characteristics of the adolescent. They are selfish. They have little or no sense of responsibility. They are unable to react to problems with a good emotional reaction. And sometimes individuals, to demonstrate their independence, look what I can do and nobody can stop me, they go out and get married. Not because they're seeking interdependence, but to assert their independence. And when adolescents get married, they're either going to have to grow up or their marriage is going to blow up because when you've got an adolescent in a marriage, you've got trouble. When you've got an individual characterized by selfishness in that relationship, you've got a troubled relationship. And so there's to be the leaving that there might be the cleaving. Now, the word cleave here means to weld. It means to adhere tightly. It refers to that which is not prone to separation. 1 Corinthians 7 opens answering the question, is marriage legitimate? Yes, it is. It closes answering the question, is marriage permanent? Yes, how permanent? Till death do us part. You know, you don't enter marriage with the idea, if this doesn't work, we'll get out. Most couples getting married in America today do not plan to stay married. And when you enter the marriage with that attitude, as soon as a little smoke goes up in the marriage, you're not looking to put out the fire. You're headed for the escape hatch. The marriage scene in America would be radically transformed out of recognition if every couple began with the proposition, there's no way out. We're going to stay in this. We're going to put out the fires. We're going to make this work. And then finally, in verse 25 of chapter 2, they were both naked. The man and his wife were not ashamed. There's to be complete honesty, transparency, nothing hidden, no secrets, in this, the most sacred of all human relationships. So there we have the foundation of the family, uh, where two individuals leave their parents' family, and they form a new family. Now, to talk about the husband's role and responsibility in this, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to start with about verse 22. Go down through about verse 29, where Paul gives a twofold role and responsibility for the husbands. Let me give you an outline of Ephesians 5, um, 23 to 29, let's say. In verses 23 and 24, we have the scriptural position 
of the husband. He is the leader in the home. In verses 25 to 29, we have the supreme passion of the husband. He is the lover in the home. The first responsibility lends authority to the relationship. The second lends affection. And one without the other always produces distortion. When you've got leadership without love, you've got dictatorship. When you've got love without leadership, you've got a weak sentimentality that doesn't command respect. The balance designed by God is that the husband, like Christ, is to be a leader who loves. Now, before we talk about uh, what it means for the husband to be a leader, we, we need to do some blasting before we do any building. We, we need to address some erroneous concepts that people have about the husband's leadership before we see what Paul means by it. So let me tell you some things that headship, a husband's headship, is not. It's not a dictatorship. It's not the establishing of an autocratic rule where the husband speaks and the wife jumps and the kids jump. Where the husband is a sole potentate whose word goes without question, without challenge, without argument. Husbands are to be the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church. Look at verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife as also Christ is head of the church. He is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. The husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is head of the church. Christ is not a dictator. He is he's not in the business of cramming things down people's throats against their will. Secondly, headship does not mean that the wife is inferior. Galatians chapter 3 verse 28 establishes the spiritual equality of men and women. As persons, a husband and wife are equal. As partners, there is a functional difference that's been designed by God in which he says to the husband whom he created first, you're the head, and he says to the wife, you're to submit to his headship, but that has nothing to do with equality. That only has to do with making things work. You can have too many chiefs. You can have too many cooks in the kitchen. You've got to be, have someone leading. You've got to have someone following. God is the one who designed all of this. And it's false doctrine to say that a wife is somehow inferior to her husband because he's the head and, and she's not. Don't charge Paul with being a woman hater because of what he says here. I had a class in Greek, University of Illinois, uh, back in the 70s, and it was taught by uh, a Methodist minister in town. But I mean, he was a professor also. And we were translating 1 Corinthians, and I'll never forget when we got to chapter 7, he's reading along, and he pauses and looks up and says, you know, my wife just hates Paul. Well, that says more about her than it says about Paul. God is the one who set up this relationship. If a wife has a problem submitting to her husband's headship, if a husband has a problem being a husband, even as Christ is head of the church, their problem is with the God who designed this. Okay, a third thing. Headship doesn't mean that a husband makes all the decisions in the family. Husbands, your wives are experts in subjects that you are totally ignorant in. And wouldn't it be foolish of you not to recognize their gifts and talents and abilities and take advantage of their insights and of their perspectives and allow their wisdom and their knowledge to bless the home? Headship does not mean that a husband makes all the decisions. It means he's responsible for all the decisions. The buck stops with him. 
I guess about anybody could make the decision, but he's responsible for it. Now, what's a husband and wife to do when they disagree? Some subject comes up, some topic in the family, and they've talked it out, and they cannot agree. I'll tell you what you need to do. You better keep talking till you find some common ground. You better keep talking till you find a compromised position you both can live with because husbands, if you cut off the conversation, if you cut off the discussion and arbitrarily make a decision, you are inviting the bitterness and the resentment of your wife. And it'll be a Pyrrhian victory. You'll lose more than you gain. Now, if there is ever a time in a marriage, and I, I hope there's never a time in your marriage where you just can't get together on it, then of course the one who is the head, who is the responsible one for the decision made, must make the decision. But that doesn't mean he's going to make the right decision. And wives, God does not hold you responsible for stupid decisions your husbands make. He'll hold them responsible for that. He holds you responsible for how you submit to that decision. And then the fourth thing I'll say is that the Bible never teaches that headship is to be demanded. Husbands have no right to force their wives into submission, to resort to any kind of carnal measure to get her to knuckle under, to kowtow, and to go along with whatever decision he's made. That's not the way Christ did it. And that's not the way husbands are to do it. So what does headship mean for the husband biblically? Go back to chapter 5. Uh, look at verse 23 carefully. The husband's the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. You know what headship means? It means you're responsible for saving your wife. Not from damnation, that's the work of Christ. But from the damage that a pagan society is trying to wreak on her. God gives wives husbands that the husband can guard and lead and protect his wife and his family from the devastation and deterioration of society. The role of the husband is as the head. What's the responsibility of the husband? Let's start reading with verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So ought husbands to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord the church. The responsibility of the husband is to love. I don't know of any more tremendous assignment given anybody in all of the Bible than the command, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Not like your dad loved your mother. Not like they do it on the movie screen out in Hollywood. Not like your friends do it. You love your wife as Christ loves the church. You know how Christ leads? It's not from behind driving. It's out in front drawing. The love that he shows for his bride draws her, doesn't drive her. And that's the way husbands are to lead. By so loving that that woman wants to follow, wants to be behind him, wants to be there with him in the closest fellowship because of how his love draws. L let me ask you to do something. Get the uh, mental blackboard of your brain operational. And on the, uh, the left side of the blackboard, write a big H. On the right side, write a big W. 
And then up above, from the H to the W, draw an arcing arrow. And then underneath the W, draw an arcing arrow back to the H. Now, if you can picture what I just described, here's what I mean by that. Every command of God is given to the individual responsible for initiating the action. Husbands are to love their wives. Wives are to submit to their husbands. And the way it's supposed to work in a marriage is that the husband who is the initiator, I've read this, I believe it, if you've got a marriage that's in trouble five years after the ceremony, you can almost always lay the blame at the feet of the husband. Now, there may be exceptions, but I'm talking about the rule. Because the husband, the reason there's problems five years in, the husband's not been loving, even as Christ loved the church. When a husband loves his wife as Christ loves the church, you know what that encourages her to do? To submit, to show respect. As he perceives that submission and respect coming, what's that going to encourage him to do? To work harder at loving her, which encourages her to work harder at submitting. And marriages get going in this good spiral upwards. But what often happens is the husband drops the ball. He does not love his wife as Christ loves the church. That puts a stumbling block in front of her, and she retaliates by not submitting, by not respecting and the husband perceives that, and his response is, two can play that game. And he loves even less. And she submits even less. And marriages get going in this downward death spiral. And if your marriage is going that direction, and you're, you're wanting to stop it, husbands, you're responsible as the head to take the initiative. Love takes the initiative. 1 John 4, 10. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave his son to be the propitiation for our sins. John says love consists of two things. It takes the initiative. It takes the blame. Love takes the first step. We love him because he first loved us. If you've got a marriage tonight in trouble, husbands, before God, you're the ones responsible to do something about it by loving your wife as Christ loved the church. And your love's not going to be conditioned on what she's doing now or does tomorrow or does a month down the road because the kind of love Christ has is unconditional, isn't it? Until somebody is ready to do the right thing in a marriage, that marriage is not going to get any better. And notice what Paul goes on to say about Christ's love for the church. He loved the church realistically. He knew we were sinners. He didn't think he was getting a princess. He knew we had all kinds of problems. He knew we had spots that had to be cleaned out. He knew we had wrinkles that had to be ironed out before we would be holy and without blemish. He knew the church was a project. He loved the church sacrificially. He gave himself for it. The church, or the, the home, uh, is not a man's castle. The home is a man's calvary, where in love he makes the sacrifices necessary for the well-being of his wife. And Christ loved the church absolutely. He wasn't flirting around with anybody else. All of his love was reserved for the church. And so the role and responsibility of the husband is to lead and to love in both cases as Christ was head, as Christ was lover of the church. Well, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3 uh, to talk about, in closing, the wife's role and responsibility. 1 Peter 3, the first six verses. There are two major thrusts. In verses 1 and 2, we're given the character and attitude of the wife. In verses 3 through 6, 
We're told about her conduct and adornment. 1 Peter 3, verse 1, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Wives, be submissive. It's hard to think of any area in which there is more resentment than in this matter of submission. Some people think the only ones in all the Bible called upon to do any submitting are wives. And nothing can be further from the truth. In fact, back in Ephesians 5, Paul prefaces what he says about the husband's role and responsibility by telling husbands and wives to submit to one another. Love always has a submissive component to it. And husbands need to recognize that. But turn back to Acts chapter 9. Let me take you to this text very quickly that uh, gives us a picture of what's involved in submission. Acts chapter 9, starting with verse 10. Public enemy number one is in action. Saul of Tarsus, breathing out threatening and slaughter against the, the church. And what Saul was illustrating by his persecution of the church was the uh, principle of spiritual, spiritual thermodynamics. The greater the heat, the greater the expansion. And now he's on the road to Damascus. High noon. He was a fanatic. Mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the noonday sun. And Paul's out there too. When everybody else is in, under the shade, siesta, Paul's out there on the road to Damascus. And the Lord appears to him and tells him to go into Damascus and to wait for further instructions. And pick up with verse 10. Now there was a certain disciple of Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in the vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. Behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in, putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. I don't think Ananias heard another word after he heard Saul of Tarsus. And the reason I think that is because as soon as he can jump into the conversation, he's going to fill the Lord in on something the Lord probably is unaware of. Verse 13, Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name, and that includes me. And I'm not sure Ananias said all he intended to say. I kind of suspect he had some more to say. I kind of think the Lord cut him off. In verse 15, the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way. Now that's submission, folks. God said, No, uh, go. Ananias first said, I'm not so sure, Lord. But when God made his will clear, Ananias went his way. He didn't understand it. He didn't know why he was being asked to do it. He was scared, nervous, suspicious. But when the head, the Lord, made clear to him what he wanted, Ananias obeyed. That's what submission is. Submission is obedience. Now go back to 1 Peter 3. Look at verse 1 again. The King James says, likewise, wives, likewise. American Standard Version says, in like manner. What does that word, likewise, make us do? It makes us back up. Because what the word likewise means is, a comparison is now being set up. Peter said some things at the end of chapter 2, and now he says, similar to what I said at the end of chapter 2, I've got some things to say to the wife. So when we back up into chapter 2, who is it we're reading about? Well, we're reading about Christ 
in his submission. Christ not only is noted for his headship, he's noted for his submission. Look at verse 21, 1 Peter 2. For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled did not revile in return, when he suffered he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we having died to sins might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Peter says there are three things you need to know about submission based on the example of Christ. Number one, treatment does not determine temperament. You see there where, where Peter says uh, that when he was reviled, he did not revile. When he suffered, he didn't threaten. He continued to be submissive. He continued to be obedient, and his submission and obedience were not linked to what anybody else was doing. With submission, treatment does not determine temperament. Secondly, Christ committed himself to the care of God. He committed himself to him that judges righteously. The reason Christ was being mistreated was because he was in the will of God Christ believed his father knew what he was doing. Trusted his father enough, uh, the ultimate result was worth the price. You know why he did all of that? To save us. To bear our sins on the tree. That by his stripes, we might be healed. Submission is redemptive. The purpose of obedience is redemptive. And look what Peter says in verse 1, chapter 3. Wives, likewise be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of the wives. Peter talks about a situation where you've got a mixed marriage. The wife's a believer, the husband is lost. He's not a believer. He needs redeeming. Wives, how do you redeem your lost husband? By nagging them? You know, Peter says, if they don't obey the word, they without a word, without your berating, without your insulting, without your nagging, without a word, they can yet be won by the conduct, the submissive, respectful conduct of the wife. Verse 2, while they observe your chaste conversation accompanied with fear, your godly fear, your husband won't come with you to the preaching. He won't come with you to a Bible study. He doesn't want anybody coming over studying with him. He shut his ears to the word. Wives, you can still open his eyes by your submission and by your obedience to his headship. Now that's the role that wives are called to, and it's redemptive. And look what he says in verse three to six about their conduct and adornment. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. There's probably been more nonsense per square inch written about these verses than any other paragraph in First Peter. I, I mean, there have been preachers who have taken what Peter said here, and have, have railed against women in the congregation, fixing up their hair, putting on some makeup, wearing jewelry. Well, the same passage that talks about don't fix up your hair, don't put on makeup, don't wear jewelry, says don't put on clothes. He's not talking about 
fashion, he's talking about faith. Faith takes priority over fashion. He's not making an absolute prohibition. He's saying, women, when the Word of God renews your inner person, you're going to become more beautiful every day. When the Word of God is working on your inside. And in this matter of submission, don't forget the holy women of old. And if you want an example, don't forget Sarah. Look at verse 6 again. Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Now, Abraham was quite a catch. I mean, Abraham uh, had a nephew who got in some trouble, made his own bed. Most people would have allowed him to lie in it. And when he got in trouble, Abraham takes off with his band of, of men, puts himself at risk, threatens the loss of himself and all that would mean to the family to, to, to rescue that rascal lot. When they go into the promised land, Abraham's the patriarch, and instead of him taking the best part of the land for himself, he says, Lot, you go ahead and pick what you want. Lot, of course, picks the choice piece. Abraham gets a girl, a teenage girl pregnant. They would have thrown him in jail today for something like that. Twice, he put Sarah in jeopardy by lying. Now, he was quite a catch. But Sarah obeyed him, calling him Lord. This refers to something that happened in Genesis chapter 18. The Lord and two angels have come to visit Abraham, and they tell him, picking up a thread that had started 25 years earlier when God told Abraham, from your seed's going to come the one who will bless all nations. 25 years later, the Lord's back, and he says, Abraham, you're going to have a son. Abraham's 100, Sarah's 90. Their procreative powers were dead. The Bible tells us that. Sarah is listening at the keyhole there in the tent. And when she hears she's going to have a baby, she just starts laughing. Uh, that's what the word Isaac means, laughter. Abraham laughed from joy. Sarah laughed from skepticism and unbelief. But she was thinking about something, and the point is, even when she thought about her husband, her thoughts were submissive, her thoughts were godly. When she thought, she thought, how is it that my Lord and I, not that nitwit, how is it my Lord and I are going to have a child seeing it, we're at the age we are? And Peter says, wives, you can be like Sarah if you do good and don't let fear get the best of you. I remember in Bible class one time in Rantoul, we were studying this passage, and I, I just asked the ladies in the class, what are you afraid of? And Joy Barb said, uh, we're afraid it won't work. We're afraid submission won't work. And when you're afraid it won't work, that's when you start looking for carnal measures to bring about change in your husband. Don't have that kind of fear. You stay true to what the Lord's called you to, to loving submission, and the Lord will bless that. He values that of great price. Well, back in uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, after reading that great conclusion about a man leaving and cleaving, we read this, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Satan never distorts in the area of the trivial, always in the area of the crucial. And the fact there are so many distortions about marriage and the family is indicative of the importance he places on destroying our marriages and our families. The stability again of society, of the government, of the church itself rests on the stability of your marriage and your family. 
And we've been stuttering when we should have been speaking. We should never be ashamed to speak of that which the Spirit of God was not ashamed to reveal. And let's take a stand for godly families and set the example by being godly in our own family, in our own marriage. Thank you for listening tonight. God bless you for being here. If there's anyone who wants to be part of the family of God, who wants to be part of that bride that Christ has for his own, if you'll repent of sin, if you'll confess that Jesus is your Lord, call him Lord. Sarah called Abraham Lord. Call Christ Lord and be baptized for the remission of sins. You'll be forgiven. If anyone needs to come, we invite you to come now while together we stand and while we sing. Let's pray. Most glorious Father in heaven, we once again come before you with praise in our hearts, Father, with love for you because you first loved us. Father, we're so blessed to have an understanding of your word. We're so blessed to have that word that you've provided for us, Father. And, and we're so blessed when we live by that word, Father. We see you working in our lives. Once again, we thank you for men like Ken, Father, who can bring your word to us, Father, in a way that we can understand, in a way we can apply our lives. And help us, Father, to do just that, to apply it to our lives. Once again, as we see the world around us, Father, and the evil that's around about us, we know that the only purity that exists is within your body. And we seek to be pure, Father, and to be holy in your sight, that we may at one day, Father, join with you in eternity. Once again, we seek to be examples to those round about us, Father, and want brothers and sisters here in, in this body, Father, and then out in the world, in our lives, in work, and school, and wherever we may go, Father. Help them, others see you within us and the love that you have for us. Help us to show that to them as well. Father, we know there are many here who are facing various trials. Pray that you'll lift them up and strengthen them and bless them, Father. We know there are many who are mourning. We just pray that you'll comfort them as long as you can. 
Once again, guide us, Father. Keep us safe as we travel. We thank you once again for your son, his sacrifice, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.